Welcome to Amiga Ireland. It's our January episode of the new year. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, I'm Irla. And I'm Rob. <laughs> and that's it for today. Uh, unfortunately, we have a scheduling issue with Luke. He can't make, quite make it, but we'll talk to Luke uh, next time. He's in home! Washing his tights! <laughs> in this month's episode, Amiga Ireland 2021 online is happening in just over a week. Book your tickets. Uh, we have a quick look at an uh, open source cannon fodder engine. And the Computer Museum of Ireland gets a new website. So before we get stuck into the news, games and so on, Rob, how have you been? It's been a couple of weeks. Basically, spent spent Christmas here. Uh, I, was, I was on myself because of various reasons. So uh, I was on my own. So um, family's all you've reunited again now. But uh, yeah, spent a couple of weeks relaxing, watching TV and doing a fair bit of coding as well, which was... Uh, yeah, great, great fun all around. Lovely. Lovely How was stuff. yours? Uh, it was, it was good. You know, we we didn't get that much time off uh, in the end. You know, we, we've got, we've gotten a lot of breaks and little holidays uh, throughout the year because of the the, the oddness of twenty twenty and all that. But we kind of yeah. had to make up for it there at the, at the end of the year. So, yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll all have a better year this year, and it won't just be you know the director's cut of twenty twenty <laughs> all over again. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably a slightly shorter episode this week since we're in the run-up to the event and we're preparing all kinds of things. So we'll move on to the news. Amiga Ireland 2021 is happening on January the 16th. As we already mentioned there at the beginning, you can go to Eventbrite. Uh, we have the link here for you in the show notes and book your ticket. Alana Kelly, director of the Computer Museum of Ireland, has finished a huge website overhaul for the for the site with her group. And that's, uh, yeah, so lots of, lots of work done there. That's great. Yeah, that was really nice. They've got some nice video tours put on, and yeah, you can um, and you can find out upcoming events. Fair play to them there for that. Mm-hmm. And this one comes in from Microchip in the Amiga Ireland IRC channel. Uh, so thanks for this, Mike. SD box for Amiga gives you SD uh, card uh, connectivity for the Amiga 500. That's pretty cool. I love seeing the Amiga 500 getting some love because it's usually yeah, uh, well, it can often be at the back of the pile for some of the more uh, advanced stuff like that. Um, so you can order the board yourself um, if you don't want to build it and there are videos at the link showing it in action pretty cool for the next gen people OS 4.1 final edition has had another update so this is uh, this came out of the blue this is a complete surprise for a lot of people um, so this is update 2 of OS 4.1 final edition and that is available from the Hyperion website if, if you log into your account details there um, there's nothing groundbreaking or anything like that but there's a lot of bug fixes you know a lot of improvements in the usb stack and uh you know general fixes here there and everywhere there seems to be an awful lot of uh like many 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 small fixes as in you know so it's quite a big update but i think there's practically every part of the operating system got something small done to it and uh yeah so uh if you have os4 or 4.1 there that's uh that's there to download Oh, that's great. We have some uh, OS4 users uh, in Amiga Ireland and listening to the podcast, so that's good news for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I get my A1222, it'll be good news <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> a new YouTube series, Amiga Hardware Programming in C, has started on YouTube. This is by Weiju Wu, and he's been he's still uploading these, uh, so you can go there and catch up and continue with him. The explanations are really good and you know he uses visual kind you know he uses graphics and diagrams to explain things um i haven't watched a full episode yet but um honestly i i, I do think at times i could spend my whole life learning about amiga um, and never get tired of it with all the great <laughs> content that's out there <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, that would be especially handy for anyone who's thinking of uh writing a, uh, a driver for anything you know, because that's uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an aspect of uh, that doesn't really always get associated with C. It's quite you know quite often associated with assembler getting down and down to the hardware level. But it's actually, you know, it does it does actually work quite well once you once you get your head into that kind of mindset. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's going to be very helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, I was uh, talking to uh, Nivrig Nivrig Gaming uh, John mm-hmm. there, and uh, you know, talking about the difference between assembler and C. This is quite a while back uh, a good few weeks ago and yeah uh, he's he i think i think he was basically saying go with c <laughs> even you know I, I had the choice to learn either you saying go go with c so when a hardcore assembly programmer tells you to go with c i think uh, 
<laughs> for a beginner, it's, it's, it's good advice. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a hardcore assembly programmer who was a hardcore assembly programmer 20 years ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what's yeah, happened there. Yeah. Like, life's well. too short for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a time and a place, I think. And sort of, you know, when you've got limited spare time with kids and stuff like that, it's a different ball game altogether. And you don't have two hours for unraveling tens of thousands of lines of stuff when, you know, 50 lines of C will do it. And, yeah. you know, just throw extra CPU cycles at it and, and be happy. That's that's yeah, it. Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling the same because, you know, there's some some projects I'd love to get stuck into and I'm just kind of like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it in Blitz or I'll do a bit of it in C. And, but I'm not, the, you know, by rights, they should be done in, in, in really, really hardcore assembly, but I'm, I'm not even going to attempt it because it's, it'll just never happen. But anyways, um, next item is a, is a DIY real-time clock project by Marcel Jena. And apologies if I'm not pronouncing that right. But this is basically uh, this is a real-time clock add-on for for the lower end Amigas, like the 500,000, where um, they don't have an onboard one, and you know, so if you don't have one on your memory expansion or it's been killed by battery leakage or whatever, um, that this is one that fits basically into the CPU socket. And so it just, it simply just hooks into the system there. It's very simple to make. It's an open source thing, things you can download the, the schematics and the, the, all the board stuff and just basically solder it up yourself and away you go. So for earlier systems, you need to patch the OS to use it because of the, the actually the early systems use a different address for the, for the clock than the later ones. So, um, it's, um, yeah, so base, basically, you just need to work around that. But um, if you're if you're familiar with those systems, you'll you'll know that already. But um, yeah, so that, so that's it. So it's a nice little project there. It, it's it's only a few parts, and it's a readily available clock chip from you know all the main suppliers. And that's uh, yeah, it's it's a, a a good one to get started on your DIY hardware journey. Yeah, that is a nice uh, starter one, isn't it, for somebody who's just kind of uh, getting to, getting to grips with that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Super Go Down the Hole beta has been released by Iraq, and this actually came out on Christmas Eve, which was the day after we recorded our last podcast episode. Um, Naturally. Uh, this is a Mario clone, and it runs on the Amiga 500, which is amazing to see from uh, New mm-hmm. Games. Iraq is a machine. He's, he's like, tur- turning out these uh, game engines and just, you know, I don't know when he has time to do anything else. He but, is, um, I don't know how he does it. You know, it he's, well, he's yeah. constantly... In, you know, releasing updates. He's constantly patching games. He's, you know, he's, oh, he's a legend. Yeah, he's great. And on the subject of games, by the way, we don't really have a gaming section this month due to uh, busyness and all kinds of things. We're going to skip over the games and we're going to go straight to discoveries. So here we go. Uh, we've talked about Amiga floppy labels here in the past. In fact, there were some based in Poland and we even made some of our own here. Um, and now the Turkish Commodore group have um, shared their Google Drive folder with a load of game labels and what they have done is instead of going for like the existing ones out there have a kind of a unified look to them where there's a kind of an Amiga logo on it across the bottom and a a space for the game graphics and logo they've kind of taken the box art um, and made the entire label like that and they are absolutely beautiful so you just bring it to a good printer these are worth getting printed uh, in a print shop onto adhesive a4 and you cut them out and put them on your labels they are gorgeous and they have done so many i mean i think i got something like i don't know 12 or 18 of them done myself of my own created these guys have mm-hmm. done in, in a similar style to my own they've even got a little bit at the back where when you flip it over the back side of the floppy disk and stick it it, it lines up nicely there so um these are made by decipher and gang and uh they're honestly as good as could be uh they've got super frog turrican civilization goblins two pang robocause there's at least a hundred at least there in the list so go and check it out that's awesome uh some uh awesome hardware that's been sort of brewing away in the background is the pie storm and this this is um yeah, you know, there's a lot of people sort of talked about this kind of thing before, but this is essentially, it's a 68K emulator for the Raspberry Pi, but it actually connects to a 68,000 CPU socket. 
So it's an emulator that actually provides the signals of the 68,000 CPU, not just sort of like, you know, the instructions in a software environment like, um, like let's say UAE or that. So it runs on the Raspberry Pi and it, it runs as far as the machine's concerned as a 68,000. So this is basically, uh, like a, a Raspberry Pi accelerator. And there, there are some computers that have, had that kind of facility already like you know the i think this the spectrum next i think has that kind of capability and stuff so this is this is a similar idea for that for for the amiga and um yeah that, again that's open source and it's a you know very interesting project to have a look at and uh yeah hat tip to microchip again for that one yeah fair play microchip for uh, practically sponsoring the episode um <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really cool he was saying in irc that the uh, the um the Raspberry Pi Zero, I think, uh, can equate to around an 040 in terms of performance. Now, my memory could be uh, that was that was about an hour ago. I was chatting to him, so no, no, that sounds about right. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the Pi, the Pi Zero, for anyone who doesn't know it, is is awesome because you know the the Pi's in general have been getting more and more powerful and just like you know they're they're great little machines. They're you know they're you know little little beasts, but the Pi Zero is a, a, a diet Pi basically. And it's a tiny little version of the Pi and a absolute minimum of um hardware on it. So uh you know, but it's 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 you can buy it for buttons and and solder away and if you ruin it, ah sure, you know, it's probably only a tenner. Or whatever they are. They're they're not definitely not expensive. They're great little things. And um Rob, how would the then the, the timing be on something like that? Because you know on FPGA like you've got you've got exact timing. Would it be more like soft a software emulated UAE um, kind of thing? Well, basically it's gonna be like UAE in that, yeah, clock for clock, it's not going to be exactly right. But the thing is that it's so because it's fitting into the socket, it's it will be good. You know what I mean? You, because the timing with things like mouse movement and screen updates, that's the rest of the computer. It's not doing any of that. So, you know, your chipset are still doing all the graphics and stuff like that. You're still getting your native output. You're still using their native keyboard and mouse and joysticks and all that. That's all. None of that timing's changed. So but essentially, this is no different to putting an, an accelerator like a, if you put an 030 accelerator in there, like a terrible fire, uh, you know, the 536 or one of them, they don't match the timing of the 500 either, even though they're, you know, so the 68030, it, it completely just basically just does its own thing. And then when it needs to, it waits for the clocks to synchronize, basically, and then shoots its information in or out of the motherboard and then carries on doing its own thing. So the timing wise, it's not an issue for these kind of setups, not an issue at all. And you're not you're not going to see that. All you'll see is the faster CPU speed, but the graphics and the the, the screen updates and the, all the the I/O stuff that's all be exactly the same. That is amazing. I didn't realize that was possible. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a it is it's a, yeah, it's basically an accelerator. You know, it's it's not um, it's not a system emulator. Like it's not uh, emulating. The chipsets, and that's and that's kind of a, a, a sort of a key aim for that project. Very nice, very nice. Well, speaking of emulation, actually, there are two emulators that have been brought out by Dirk W Hoffman, and that are available for download. And they are Virtual C sixty four and V Amiga. Um, now, V Amiga is in beta, and the developer has created ADFs with test applications to run to find problems. So you can play with the application, you can use it for your own stuff, and you can run some tests. And I'm sure you'd probably be happy to have you report back on on your results in your system. Uh, it looks really nice, and if you have a, a Mac uh, computer, it's it kind of you know it uses that those kind of window decorations, and it, it is nice. And I haven't had time to try it myself, but when the uh, January event is behind me, I'll definitely give it a go. So you can visit github.com there at Dirk Hoffman and check it out. Now, Open Fodder is a um, very interesting looking thing. It's 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 a an engine for um, Canon Fodder. It's a new Im- implementation of the Canon Fodder engine. So so and what that means is that it will take it's it's a complete modern piece of code. So uh, you know so it'll, and it runs in Windows and run it runs in Linux or at least it's, the source is there and it'll compile on Linux. Um, it and and basically that will take your original Canon Fodder game files and run them on you know on a modern system and so so you don't need dosbox and you don't need any you know or uae to run them and that lets it run on it so it gives you sort of control over your screen modes and things like that and and uh and it also lets you um well as well as importing the original game files which you know if you have uh 
WHD load, you'll have you'll have them on your hard disk anyway. You can um, create new levels and edit edit levels. You know, so so basically, you know, you can make a new level and upload it somewhere and, or send it to people, and and then they can play it. And so it's, it sort of creates this, um, yeah, slightly more open system for uh, you know for sharing that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, this this it looks really cool. And uh, you know it's it's similar to um, there's a Settlers one as well. Uh, it's Open Surf, and that actually has an Amiga oh, yeah. OS four version and an Amiga OS four port, and that's a similar idea for Settlers. And it you know you can load in your Settlers files and modify it and play them in a nice big screen mode. And that, so it's 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 the same idea. And I I like seeing these things these reworks coming through because uh, you know they kind of keep the keep they keep the original game intact because they're using the original game files and the original campaigns, but they're uh, you know, letting you run it without having to use an emulator and, let, you know, giving you an, a sort of a more modern uh, approach to it. Yeah, I, I love the idea of level editors because, you know, that that binds people together then where they can create levels and share them and, and stuff like that and it keeps the game alive a bit longer. There's, there's so many benefits to level editors. Absolutely, yeah. Now, the Australian Amiga Gazette was a magazine uh, in the 90s in Australia uh, that I somehow came across online a while back. And they have been scanned online and made available online for download. So the creator of this uh, was charging about three euro an issue, and they were they were good issues. I, I'd have been really happy to get those back then. I'm enjoying reading them now, actually. And um, the, uh, basically, he he decided to go off and buy a professional printer uh, that a print shop would use, and started making a magazine that covered all kinds of news, reviews, uh, technical advice. Um, one issue focuses on Workbench, another one on MIDI on Amiga, uh, another one was a kind of a, a cover of the uh, Amiga Expo in Melbourne at the time. So um, they're free online and they were well worth having a look at. And finally, uh, my last discovery is Slider 2, which is a game for Workbench. But unlike most Workbench games that run inside a window, uh, this actually takes over the whole screen and uh, it looks like a game that you would have booted off a disc. Um, So it's basically just a number sliding puzzle. You know, those little those little plastic things you used to get with kind of four across, four down plastic numbers, and there was one missing, and you would jumble them up and have to slide them back hmm. into order. So it's basically that, and you can have either numbers or an image um, on it. Uh, they're the two options. Now, the, the image one didn't work for me, but I didn't give it uh, a whole lot of time, so it's possibly I didn't do, do something properly. But um, it looks really nice, um, and it's an enjoyable game. Now, it's mouse based. I would really have liked if you could use the arrow keys because you can really fly around with the arrow keys but um it's still a really pleasant <laughs> pleasant simple game to play and that is the end of our discoveries next up ask amiga okay so this is a, a question that came up on the retro computing stack exchange site and it was basically asking um if you use a, a, an internal clock a real-time clock on the Amiga 1200 does it clash with the real-time clock on the accelerator? So basically, the Amiga 1200 doesn't have an onboard clock, but it has a little connector for one, which is used for cl- clocks and a whole heap of other things. But um, as a result, back in the day, practically every accelerator came with a clock on board because it was sort of, you know, compared to the rest of the accelerator, relatively cheap. And, you know, basically everyone needed one. So um, so it was kind of one of those things that just came with all accelerators because once you start using the Amiga seriously, it's a thing that's nice nice to have. Because you have your clock on the accelerator, you can fit a second one on the clock port. And the short answer is it's probably not a good idea. But um, slightly longer answer, it depends on how the accelerator works. Because um, what happens is the accelerators tend to have their own sort of subsystem of uh, addressing and logic and stuff like that on, on the board. And they don't always give everything to the motherboard. So, um, you know, they, they quite often have um, their own sort of, uh, t- like, addressing just inside the accelerator. And it depends on the design of the accelerator. The, the um, 6802, 6803 accelerators probably will clash. And if they do clash, it's going to be a problem because what will happen is you'll have ba- basically what you have, what's called a chip select signal. And the clock chip, once it gets a chip select signal, it will um, it takes over the bus and it puts its information on the bus for the CPU to read. So basically, on the motherboard, that chip select signal comes from Gale, and when Gale sees an, an address that matches something, 
coming from the CPU, it says, okay, this is the right chip select for you. And it will turn on the clock chip select when the clock address is on the address bus. So it will, it, it will do that at the same time that the CPU card is doing it for its own clock thing. And as a result, you get both clock chips putting numbers on the bus at the same time, which is, you know, either going to end in garbage or possibly, you know, stress out chip inputs, outputs here and there if they're fighting each other. Um, but you know, you, you won't get, you know, unless your both clocks happen to be absolutely synchronized, you won't get any kind of reasonable information out of it. So it's generally not a good idea to do that. Now, the higher up cards, like the 040 and 060 cards, they tend to have the CPU a little bit further back from the bus and don't always give the full addressing to the motherboard. Now, I'd have to, I'd have to look at the cards specifically to, to know for sure, but sometimes, when they have some local things that they're addressing, those address lines don't ever go near the motherboard. And, um, you know, so you might find that the motherboard clock port uh, simply is never triggered or, the, you know, the real time clock on the motherboard is never triggered. And the, you know, the, the system only reads from the one on the accelerator. But um, regardless of that, because you can't be sure of that being the case, it's generally a good idea not to put two chips at the same thing at the same address you know it's it's kind of the same situation as you know using a pcm cia card with four megabytes you know with more than four megabytes of what's called zero two ram you know basically because they'll both be at the same address and when the cpu tries to read from one they'll both answer and instant crash effectively uh, yeah. so uh, yeah just yeah just don't do it fair enough that's that's me warned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're unlikely to do any major damage, I suppose. But uh, you probably find yourself in a reset loop as it tries to read the clock when it boots. You know, so uh, you know, probably probably not the most fun. You probably wouldn't have the machine on long enough to do itself damage. Let's say. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for that, Rob. Um, it's it's not something that uh, I planned on doing, but I did wonder about it myself because of the the different port, because of the fact that there's an RTC port, obviously, on my motherboard and on my accelerator. Mm. Um, I was I was curious. I should just point out though that um, the clock port on the Amiga 1200 is used for a load of different things, and that's perfectly fine because that actually responds to a different address. So it's literally only the clock add-ons that will clash with other clock add-ons. If you have like a cat weasel or a USB card on your clock port, mm, makes no difference. Doesn't it? Doesn't have any okay. effect on the clocks on the accelerator. That gives me another question, but I'll save that for next month. <laughs> 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 Listen, uh, th- uh, hello to everybody who has signed up for Amiga Ireland Online. Um, looking forward to meeting you on Saturday week for the day. And uh, we've got some nice guests lined up, a few nice gaming competitions as well to go with it. And uh, we'll talk to you then. Now, music was by Virtual Dimensions and Banjo Gayali. Feel free to get in touch at info at amigausers.ie. This episode was edited by Anthony Jarvis and we're playing out with Ghouls and Ghosts Continue, originally by Tim Fallon, but this arrangement is by Zacco Garcia Piveri. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you in a week or two.